the Board Bia Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards of traceability and care for the environment. Hello and welcome to Nevin's Irish Food Trails and welcome on board the Shannon Princess which is my home for the series. The hotel barge is based in Loch Ree, and as the lock is right in the centre of Ireland it's the perfect place from which to explore the country. Today my food trails take me to Wexford to meet Ireland's only commercial blackcurrant producer. I travel to Limerick to have tea in some old-fashioned tea rooms and I come back on board the Shannon Princess to make a traditional pear tart. But first, it's off to Limerick to sample its bacon and pork. Number One Perry Square is a boutique hotel in the Georgian quarter of Limerick City. Tim Harris is the head chef at the hotel's Sash Restaurant. It's nice for me to be cooking in a restaurant rather than in the kitchen. Absolutely, no, you're more than welcome. So Tim, what dish are you going to cook for me today? So we're going to cook a chacrout gani. It's a uh, French Alsatian dish. We're going to start, we've pre-boiled our ham hock to take out, leach out the salt. We've refreshed our water, so we're just going to pop that back in. So it's a lovely ham hock from a local butchers here, Michael Lachlan's. He brines them himself for us. And then we're going to, we're going to get our vegetables started. So Can I help you? Absolutely, I okay, love you too. You tell we're going to peel the onion and the carrot, okay, so there's a, there's a paring knife for you there. Um, we have a, just a basic mirepoix of vegetables, so we have the onions, the carrot, mm -hmm. leek, uh, some celery. Because it's such a slow cook, it's a three hour long cook, the onion can stay whole. All the flavours kept in the pot. All the flavours were kept in the pot. And Tim, tell me about the whole connection with limerick and pork and ham and all that. Here in Limerick, it was affectionately known as Pig Town years ago. My wife's grandfather, JJ Kennelly, actually has fond memories of when he was a young lad of about seven, back in the 1930s, he would, uh, his family would keep pigs, three pigs themselves in their backyard. And most of the families around wow. Limerick would, uh, would keep pigs themselves. They would take them into town and sell them to the, to the different bacon factories and pork factories. There was Shaw's, there was Mattison's, uh, Brady's and, and, and Denny's on William Street. Okay. You know, um, bacon and ham from Limerick was, was always sold at a premium in the English markets. So we've got a whole head of fennel okay. that we're going to pop straight in. I love the flavour of aniseed with Don't our pork. Cut there, that? No, no everything's them. going straight in, whole. We'll grab the That's wider end okay. of the leek. Perfect. Our garlic can go straight in as well. It's a three hour cook. We're just going to bring this to a simmer for about an hour and then we're going to start adding our other ingredients. Other ingredients. Okay, so, so we'll leave that for an hour now. Okay. okay. After an hour, Tim adds some peppercorns, some dry juniper berries, some fennel seeds, a couple of bay leaves, a loin of smoked back bacon, and an aged French pork sausage. Then he adds some locally made Cumberland sausage and a pork and leek sausage, a couple of slices of good bean salami, and finally some potatoes. This all simmers away for another hour or so. So Tim, after two hours and 20 minutes, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. It's been cooking away. Everything's nice and soft and tender. The potatoes are cooked, the sausages are cooked. So we're just gonna take this off now. Gorgeous. Uh, and we're gonna get on our sauerkraut to serve with it. The smell is beautiful. It's absolutely it's delicious. Wow. So the whole thing is done in stages. That's interesting. Your blanch off your ham hock, just put it Absolutely, into water. Yeah. You, know. uh, you need to take out of the salt because it's quite yes. salty, the ham hock. So we blanch it off, uh, it, it leaches out the salt. And then it's, and then it's important to, to cook everything in stages, as mm -hmm. you said, uh, Nevin. So our ham hock takes the longest to cook and that, that, that needs the two and a half, three hours to cook. Our bacon after that, so it's nice and soft and tender. Otherwise, it's just going to be chewy. Um, our sausages and obviously our potatoes, Gorgeous. they'll be the quickest to cook. Gorgeous. Okay, so, sauerkraut. Our sauerkraut yeah. over here. Uh, sauerkraut's a fermented cabbage. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll get you to just crush a few of those juniper berries for okay. me if you don't mind. How many do you want? Uh, just three or four of them will do. Three or four. Our sauerkraut goes in there to heat up. We make this, we, we shred the cabbage and, and salt it. Okay. And then just keep it in the sealed jar for uh, a few months. 
Uh, okay. So that's fantastic. That's great. Thank you very so it's much. It's very healthy, isn't it, the sauerkraut? The sauerkraut is extremely healthy. It's uh, it's got all the good bacteria for your guts, you know. Uh, so it really keeps the tummy okay. happy, you know. Um, there's actually a woman in Limerick, uh, Valerie O'Connor. Her name is, and she does uh, fermented food workshops. Really? She'll tell you all about the fermented foods and show you how to make them at home. Very easy to make and very, very good for you. So of course. We can add a little bit of cooking liquid to our sauerkraut just to moisten it up so yes. it doesn't go too dry. Smells great. Mm. And that, that juniper coming through, that's what we want, you know. So that's nice and warm now. We can let that rest and we're going to serve all of our meats on top of that. So we're just going to take out all of our lovely sausages here. It's a serious amount of food, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you what, there's... There's enough here to feed an army, I'd say. <laughs> you have so many different flavours to eat in this dish. Look at that, it's just falling apart. That's the three hour cook, you see. Gonna pop that straight there. These whole vegetables that we have in here, that we've cooked in there, they have, they're full of flavour. Mm -hmm. They're full of all that delicious porky flavour. So there's no harm in chopping them up. You can put them through the cabbage or just serve it with the dish, okay. it's fantastic. We're gonna start serving. Okay. The sauerkraut's just gonna go down there. I love your plates. These are our favourite plates. Um, Patricia, the owner, she, uh, she demands that we have oh, did she? <laughs> remove the skin there. And then there's still no cutting involved in no. this, Nevin, you know? That's how that easy is. this dish is. So that's our lovely piece of ham there. This will keep in your fridge for, for three or four days at will. Just make sure when we're heating it up, we heat it up with all of the liquid gently. so that it, yeah. nice and gently, you know? Yeah. So it doesn't dry out. Yeah. So a couple of those pieces of salami, a couple of the sausages there. You know, as I said, it's a sharing dish. A great uh, change to the Sunday roast, I yeah. think. This is the first bit of chopping I'm going to do for the dish. So that's uh, mature French sausage. It is, it? yes. It's another cured sausage, mm -hmm. you know. Lots of spices in there, lovely. A few slices of that. Yes, we have amazing. our bacon here. And it's a very popular here in the restaurant. It's people. very popular. Um, you know, in the restaurant, we like to serve it with a sparkling rosé. Okay. Um, a Riesling goes quite well with it. A nice, uh, sharp Riesling. Or... Uh, my personal favourite is a cider. We have a few artisan ciders here, and they're fabulous. I think it's important that we always have a little bit of crackling with any of our pork dishes. Crackling is so easy to make. If you just ask for a little bit of pork skin from your butchers, mm -hmm. uh, we salt it for two hours, rinse it off, and then it just goes straight in the oven, 180 degrees, and you have Hear that. perfect, perfect crackling. So that so there would be for two people sharing. Two right. people, yeah. three people. I thought you were just giving me an extra large portion. I'll, I, I'd try and oh, attack that myself, I would. Wow. So this is the gabine? That's the gabine salami there. Mm, I so love that's that. That's made in nice. Sauerkraut. It's fabulous. Good. A little bit of cider. Everything is so different. You have smoke, everything's soft, it's tender, moist, it's delicious. Absolutely delicious. It's enjoy a, cooking with it's you. It's amazing. Coming from Melbourne, cooking a French dish, but using the very best of living ingredients. I absolutely loved it. Thank you. Salancha. <laughs> The next destination on my Irish food trails is County Wexford, where I'm going to meet Ireland's only commercial blackcurrant yeah, producer, Des Jeffers. You're hard at work, so you are. Yeah, well, to take advantage of the good weather, oh, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Well, what are you doing here now? Well, basically, this is a, it's a rejuvenated blackcurrant plantation. This time last year, we cut this down. There were big old bushes. Their quality was going downhill. We just had to do something. And that's one of the systems. You cut them down to the ground and let the growth come up again. Unfortunate side of doing that, you lose a year's production. But you get a lovely burst of new, fresh growth. And then next July, this will have a nice crop of blackcurrants on it. I'm just taking advantage of this now, you know, with the good weather. Um, because we mechanically harvest these things, it just gives you an opportunity to just get rid of all branches that are sticking out. And Des, you have a beautiful farm, the hedgerows, the lovely trees, so well kept. There's a reason for it all. We're located between Wexford and Rosslare, sunny southeast, we know, yeah. but also we're very much in the prevailing winds of the southwest. So that would be the reason for our shell belt. When I was young, the system changed dramatically. Okay. You know, if we came out to a field here now and we saw any kind of grass, my God, it was kept bare, bare ground. The thinking was that, disease point of view, you get better air movement and the berries stayed cl um, cleaner and healthier. We just started doing the grassing now 20 years ago and it's so much better. You're protecting the soil, creating great habitat now for lots of good bugs, worms. There's another side to it too. I mean, we're part of the Irish and Green programme now. That basically gives us recognition for what our farming practice, what we've been doing for the last 15 years. I had a, a call from an English company and the, fir the first thing he said, he, after making his initial introduction, he says, ah, orange and green. So he is straight away, it's obviously getting great traction 
with the international market, which is what the whole scheme is about. Is this a family farm where we are here? It is. We're third generation blackcurrant growers. And is it only one variety of blackcurrant you grow here? No, we grow a few varieties to spread the seasons. Blackcurrants, they're not like, say, strawberries or other fruits where you get different flowers and they will come into fruit and they'll ripen at different times and you, know, you come back again and again and pick. Um, with blackcurrants, you really go in and it's a one harvest. Yeah. And what are the key elements for blackcurrants to grow here in Ireland? Good soil type, mm -hmm. uh, nice, good, sandy, free draining soil. Sunshine is pretty important, <laughs> mind you. Today? Probably a proper spring, summer, autumn, winter. But essentially, we don't want to have a lot of rainfall come May, June. When you're getting into the harvest time of year, uh, that's when we want to see drier weather. And what do you look for like when the crop is ready to be picked? How do you know? Is it the colour? Do you test it, taste it? Colour definitely will be well ripe, but what we really taste, yes, we will check uh, bricks level scientifically so we'll get our sugars. But also one of the main big factors is the colour of the strig. The strig starts to go brown. That shows it's, it's finished growing. So anyway, we go and have a bit of lunch. I'd love that. Good Thank stuff. you. Are you oh. cooking? <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> Oh, that looks delicious. What is it? It's a lovely old family recipe we're using. Roasted lamb shank with the blackcurrant sauce and some nice vegetables, just giving it a bit of flavour. It's just falling off the bone. Oh, fantastic. And do I smell some red wine too? You do. Little tipple. They really go hand in hand. And that's the one thing about the blackcurrants. You know, they're so versatile, they can be used, you know, as much if not more than cranberries. It's very true. You could absolutely replicate whatever you use cranberries for and replace them for blackcurrants. I chose the lamb and the blackcurrants mm. because we were lamb producers as well for many years. And uh, my local butcher, Richie Doyle in Wexford, we would have supplied him with our lambs. So you work on lots of recipes, don't you, on your website? We do. Anything to educate people and just give them ideas about the use of black currants. There's so many more uses than jams. I mean, here's a great example. Yeah. I mean, exactly. another one, what we could have done would be to have used the fruit, put it into saucepan and put some nice juice in with it and reduce a little bit and made a smash of black currant. Cool. Oh, gravy, okay. you know. I think you're a bit of a home chef. Do you know that? Well, I like eating food anyway, that's for sure. <laughs> have a little juice. Oh, gorgeous. This is our, our um, black currant cordial that we made it just colds its colour all the, all the way up to the top. We used to grow blackcurrants for Ribena, that would have been our main business. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we lost the contract for supplying them. And it forced us to say, what, what can we do? We have all this fantastic fruit, we need to do something extra. And that's where we started doing this. It's beautiful, it's lovely and fresh. There's no sugar whatsoever in it. Well, it's 100% pure juice. Mm. We want to keep it as simple as we possibly could. All our cordials will be going through a lot of health food shops throughout the country. And um, we're working with supermarket, super value supermarket, range through their food academy program. It was a great way of just getting the education into the whole idea of retail. You know, coming from the farming background, we, we were great to produce food and grow crops, but the actual making of something else and then the selling of it is uh, it's a completely different ballgame. Do you sell locally to any other businesses or anything like that? Yes, we do. One of our great customers will be Wexford Preserves in, in New Ross. They're, they're brilliant. A super, super company. And their jams are excellent and they've won lots of awards too, haven't Absolutely, they? Absolutely, yeah. Using our black currants, they got a three gold stars from the Great Taste Awards uh, this and, year. So and superb. I, I see on your bottle you have two gold stars. Yeah, we were thrilled well with that. Done. It shows how good the product is. Well, it's an amazing success story. Thank you for your time and for cooking me lunch. Great. Looking forward Thank to you. finishing it. Okay. Lovely to visit you here on your farm. Thank Thanks a million, Des. Thank you. The Board Be A Quality Mark. Ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards. The Board Be A Quality Mark. Ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards. Tucked away on the Father Russell Road in Limerick City is a real gem, Miss Marple's Tea Rooms. And Colette is the owner here beside me. Colette, you have an amazing place. Well done. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Tell me about the whole story of the place. I wanted some place where the food was good, um, didn't have to be overly fancy, just real old fashioned food. Um, and some place where people could just come and detach for what, from what was going on outside. So once you came inside the door, it was kind of like going back into your grandmother's sitting room. Similar types of food, the music, the photographs on the wall, the cloths on the table, the china. Why do you think people like nostalgia? When you were a child and you went to your grandparents, it, you always felt safe. Um, there was a hug, there was maybe something nice that you wouldn't have gotten at home. Uh, your grandparents wouldn't have been as, as 
uh, stern as your own parents. And I think sometimes when people walk in the door and they'll smell the apple pies cooking or that, it'll bring back a memory. It's lovely drinking tea from Bone China. It just tastes so much better, so it does. When it's made in a Bone China pot, it just, it adds to the flavour so much nicer than stainless steel. Real Bone China is made with 5% bone. A lot of people think that, oh, they can't take out their granny's china because it will crack. The reason it's cracking is because it's not used. It needs the heat to keep it strong, otherwise it gets brittle. You've no Wi-Fi here, is that right? I wanted to create some place that you could get away from that. Even if it was just for a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. The fact that we don't have Wi-Fi, our customers have to talk to each other. So a lot of them would have become friends from coming in here. It gives them a chance to be away from technology for a while, and then they can have some good food to go with it. The crockery is unique and beautiful, yes, isn't it? Yes, we have some gorgeous china. We love everything old, furniture, books, people, stories, music. So luckily, it all ties in. What's your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert is cream pudding. And how do you make it? Well, you start off with your breadcrumbs. Generally, I just use white breadcrumbs, including the crust. There's no need to waste it. It was a pudding that was invented originally, so there'd be no waste. If there was stale bread, you'd use that for your pudding. And then I make an egg custard. You start off where you heat your milk, some butter, the zest of a lemon, and sugar. It doesn't have a huge amount of sugar in the base because you have the sweet meringue and you have the jam. Separate your eggs, whisk the egg yolks, and pour warm, not boiling milk, but the warm milk and sugar into it. And that makes your egg custard. It's not traditional custard in that you're not thickening it before it goes in the oven. Then you just mix it with your breadcrumbs, pop the bowl into the oven and leave it for 40 minutes. As soon as it comes out, you get some jam. Traditionally, it would have been raspberry jam, but it just so happens that today I used the hedgerow because it's my favorite. Just soften that up with a, a spoon and spread it over the top, and then whisk up your egg whites with your pinch of salt and your sugar. Pop it on the top, smooth it out and put a few peaks on. You don't have to be overly artistic with it. And then into the oven for another 10 minutes, and this is wow. the way it comes out. It's a very easy dessert. There's no reason why anybody couldn't make it. And it's total comfort food. It's well worth treating your family to. You have something very, very special here. We have a great team. Lovely to see you, Cliff. And you. Thank, thank you very much, Nevin. When people think of fruit tarts, they usually think of an apple tart. Well, this is something a little bit different. It's a rustic pear tart. I think pears are underused and they're a beautiful ingredient. So making the pastry, we have our flour in here. We're gonna make it by hand. We're gonna put in the caster sugar. We're gonna mix this all together and then we're gonna rub in the butter. Have your butter at room temperature. Have it nice and soft. We want this into fine breadcrumbs. Now, if you're stuck for time, you can throw everything into the food processor. But this is a recipe from Orla Broderick, who has worked in many of my books and TV shows, and she still makes it by hand. And I'm sure a lot of you still do. I use a recipe, my Auntie Maureen's recipe, and everything goes into the food processor, which is good, still excellent recipe too. So everyone is different. You could put in the zest of some orange, you can put in some vanilla pot into this. So just look at, you're trying to get air in here. So this is just regular salted butter I'm using, because I think we have the best butter in the world. I don't think I've ever made pastry with margarine. So as if you were making a crumble, you could put some ground cinnamon, works really well into this. But we're gonna put some cinnamon into the pears. Crack in your egg. If you think it's a little bit dry, what you can do is you can simply just put in a little bit of water. So we'll mix this all together and see how we get on. Just using a spoon, and what I'll do in them, I'll use my hands. So you just mix it all together. Kind of knee it down like that. So it's nice and soft. And then what I usually do, is just put a little bit of flour, shape it, knead it all together, it's lovely and soft. I had the water just in case I needed it, but I actually didn't need it. So what I would normally do is wrap this in cling film, always label it, and I'd happily keep that for about two weeks in your fridge, or you can freeze it. So we have one already made, so we're gonna roll this out. Just gonna use roughly about a quarter of this. So we get two out of this here. I'm gonna use a little bit of flour, and flour in this here. And using a rolling pin. So you see it's not cracking, but don't worry if it does, it'll all come together. And we're gonna put them then onto some parchment paper, which is a non-stick paper. So we just arrange one. So I've just cut the parchment paper into small little squares onto a baking tray. So before you roll it, take it out for about maybe 10 minutes, just to soften it, it makes it easier. But don't leave it too long at room temperature. So can you see the technique? You roll it, you lift it. 
you roll it again. There we go. Now, so now I'm going to prepare the pear. You simply peel it using the potato peeler. You're going the full length of the pear. Pears are beautiful. They're wonderful to poach. And if you poach pears, they're lovely poached in some apple juice, some honey, a little bit of vanilla pod and cinnamon. Fantastic, Ristardis, really, really good. Cut this in half, and then we're gonna remove the core. So you keep it flat side down, and then you just trim this here. So that's the little core there removed. You can use a small little knife. It is a rustic tart, so we don't have to cut them too thin. And remember, these are gonna bake for about 30 minutes until they're beautiful and golden brown. So in the bowl, we have some lemon juice. So that's the juice of one lemon. So we'll just slice them in there. And then we need to mix this all together. So we have the pear with the lemon juice. A little bit of cinnamon, gives great flavor. Some brown sugar for sweetness. And then we have a little bit of flour. It's gonna hold everything together. So I'm gonna put some of the nuts and the hazelnuts, what I've done is just simply toasted the hazelnuts. First of all, remove the skin. How you do that underneath the grill, in the oven, for about maybe five, 10 minutes in the oven. And then what you do is put them into a tea towel, you remove the skin, and then you chop them. So when you toast them like that, they're beautiful, they're crunchy, and they release that lovely natural flavor. So you mix this all together. Now you can do this with apple, plums. So just a little bit more flour in there. So it's gonna help thicken it. And then we're gonna arrange this. So I have too many pears here. I'm just going to probably use half of this in the tarts. And you place them into the center. And this is the fiddliest part. Just making these, sprinkle them with some more of the nuts. Just a little bit more, so you get as much pear in there as possible. And another little bit. And then what you do with your pastry, you kind of bring it up, kind of build it like that. So it's kind of an open tart. Another bit more pear, and hold that all together. Now this needs to be egg washed. So I have one egg, a little bit of milk, and then you just brush the outside of the tart here. So the oven is preheated at 180, and these are gonna take anything between 25 to 30 minutes until they're beautiful golden brown and the pears are cooked. So after 30 minutes, this is what they look like. The nuts have kind of caught, which is lovely, so they'll be nice and really toasty. I'm gonna lift it out and I'm gonna cut it in half and just show you the inside. Now normally you'd serve it on its own, whole, but I just wanna show you this. Look at the way the pears are cooked. You can see the cinnamon, see the layers of the pear, the nuts. Absolutely beautiful. So we're going to arrange this on the plate. With this, a little bit of honey. This is optional. Ice cream or cream, or to be nice, a little bit healthy, some creme fraiche. Works really well. Now these are really simple, but really good, and absolutely delicious. And I think they make a perfect Sunday lunch treat. That's my rustic pear tarts with the honey and creme fraiche. In the next programme, I travel to West Cork to make cheesecake with Valerie Kingston at Leninan Farm. And then I go to Cork City itself to join head chef Mark Staples at Hayfield Manor. And of course, I'll be doing some cooking of my own on board the Shannon Princess. I hope you'll join me. The Board Bia Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards of traceability and care for the environment.